the words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in that chapter that we read at the beginning, namely the fourth chapter of the epistle of James, with special reference to verses 13 to 16. From verse 13 to verse 16 in the fourth chapter of the epistle of James. Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. I find it extremely difficult to understand anybody who does not believe that this book which we call the Bible is the Word of God. I find it very difficult to understand such a person for many, many reasons. But there are three particular reasons which seem to me to be sufficient in and of themselves to make it plain to any thoughtful, thinking, intelligent person that this is none other than the Word of God, that it isn't merely a collection of human writings, the theories and philosophies and ideas of men, but rather the Word of God, the living God, to men. Now, the reasons that are particularly in my mind this evening are these. The first is that the Bible always seems to have the perfect word and the only appropriate word to say whatever may happen to us in this life and in this world. There is nothing that can happen to us individually or collectively but that we will find somewhere or another the Bible has the perfect comment to make upon it. I'm making my statement deliberately. It doesn't matter, I say. What may happen to us? You will always find the appropriate comment here. Because, after all, the real test of our ultimate intelligence is our reactions to what happened and our comments upon what happened. That's the way we test ourselves. That's the way we can test one another. What does a man say when he hears certain things? What's his reaction to it? Does he just try to forget it, dismiss it because it's unpleasant? Or does he just make some trite, obvious remark? Or does he, looking at the thing and seeing it profoundly and its ultimate meaning and significance, say something that is of value to our soul? Now I say the Bible always has the appropriate comment the right thing to say in the light of any event or incident that may happen to take place in our individual lives or in our common lives together. And that seems to me in and of itself had we no other reasons at all for establishing the fact that this is God's word and God's comment upon life and upon all that happens to us. But let me give you a second reason. And my second reason is this, that the Bible's description of man is always up to date. You see, it's a very old book, this, written at different times over a number of centuries. And the last book written in the first century, so long ago. And it's always telling us things about men. Its whole theme is, in a sense, man in his relationship to God. But this is the astounding thing, that it doesn't matter what part of the Bible you turn to, 
And you read what it's got to say about men, and you'll find it's always true, always contemporary, always up to date. Proving, it seems to me, thereby, the Bible's own contention that the fundamental thing about men is his relationship to God. And that if that is, isn't right, well, then it doesn't really matter what happens to him in any other respect. Finally, everything is all wrong. Now, that is a great statement which you'll find everywhere in the Bible. You go through it, pick out what it's got to say about men, and you'll find that it's equally true about men today. Now, there's only one explanation of this. And that is, you see, that in spite of all the superficial changes in life that have taken place throughout the running centuries, that men as men hasn't changed at all. And the Bible says that he does not. The Bible says the important thing about men is not how he dresses, not how he speaks, nor whether he travels on foot or in an aeroplane or in a rocket or anything else. The fundamental thing about men, it says, is this, is his relationship to God. And though he may change in these other respects, this is the thing that determines what's true about men. So what it has to say about men centuries ago is as true tonight as it was when it was first written. Now there again surely is another thing that ought to convince us that this is the word of God. Because apart from this book you've had many different, different ideas with regard to men and the nature of men and the whole condition of men. They change, there are fashions, they change from century to century. And if you pick up an old book and read what it has got to say about men, and then you look at modern men, you say, what a tremendous difference. You never feel that when you're reading this book. It doesn't matter where you happen to chance upon its description of men like that which we are looking at together tonight, there at once I say you're looking at a typical representative modern man. It knows men. And it's got its finger on this central truth about men. And that brings me to my third comment, which is this. That surely the constant assertion which the Bible makes about men ought to convince us that it's the word of God. And what is that assertion? Well, it's this. That the thing that finally accounts for all men's troubles is his foolish pride. Man's real trouble is his pride. Now the Bible tells you that at the beginning of the book of Genesis. And it goes on saying it. From beginning to end. Man finds himself in a world of troubles. Things happen to him. He's always involved in these trials and tribulations and difficulties. Why is he like this? What's the matter? The Bible says there's only one answer. It's man's foolish pride. It's the thing that brought him down. It's the thing that has kept him down ever since. Very well. There I say three things without going any further, which surely ought to make us see that when we are looking into this book and considering its message, we are not listening to a human comment upon men and upon life, but to the comment of God himself. This is the word of God. Now then, let me show you how all that is illustrated in these verses that we are looking at together this evening. My subject divides itself up quite simply. And you know, my friends, I've come into this pulpit tonight with a feeling that there is something which is preaching in a way that I can never preach. And that is something that's happened during this past week. All I'm anxious to do is that you all hear that sermon that we all hear the voice of God speaking to us through that event. Well, now let me put it to you in this form by expounding these particular verses. Two things I say are said here. First of all, man's view of himself. Secondly, the true view of men. That's all it is. I could say that, couldn't I, about any text in the Bible? You can always use that as a division of a text. Man's view of himself, the truth about men. Now look at them. Take first man's view of himself. 
Now, here James puts it very perfectly in the 16th verse. Here's the key. But now, he says, you rejoice in your boasting. I said the Bible is always contemporary in what it says about men. That's what a man wrote, you see, in the first century. And this is the 20th century. James says, you are rejoicing in your boastings. Can you imagine a more perfect statement about modern men? Rejoice in your boastings. Do you prefer another translation? Listen to this. You boast in your arrogance. That's the Revised Standard Version. You are boasting in your arrogance. Or I can give you still another translation. You rejoice, says this authorized translation, in your boastings. You rejoice, we might say, in your pride of life. Because it's exactly the same word. In the first epistle of John, in the second chapter, you will find that it's put there like this. We read about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. It's exactly the same word as is translated here, boasting. You boast or exult in your pride of life. Can you, I ask again, suggest to me a more accurate description of the average, typical modern man? The man, I mean, who's not interested in the Bible, who laughs at it and scouts it at it, who doesn't, uh, is not a Christian, doesn't believe in God, he's not religious. The typical modern man, there he is, rejoicing in his boastings, glorying in his pride of life. What does it mean? Well, it means this. He uh, maintains that he has uh, surveyed life. He's a man who's got gifts, got a great brain, great intellect, and he's had the great advantage of education and learning. He's so fortunate to have lived in the 20th century. People didn't have these advantages before, but he's a man of the 20th century. And after all, life has moved and advanced, and the world is going forward. And here is this highly intelligent creature who has had all these educational advantages and has all this great knowledge at his disposal. And as the result of this, he has uh, surveyed life. And he has worked out for himself uh, a philosophy of life. He has evolved a view of life. And uh, he is very pleased with it. He is proud of, his, of himself, he is proud of his brain, he is proud of his intellect, he is proud of his knowledge, he is proud of his tremendous, indeed, staggering achievements. And of course, they are very great. Let nobody misunderstand me. The achievements of this present century have been phenomenal. The amazing discoveries that have taken place in the realm of science, in all its branches, it is indeed quite remarkable and astounding. And the modern man looks at all this and he contemplates it all with great satisfaction and great pride. You rejoice in your boasting. And that, I think you will agree with me, is the boast of the modern man. That after all, we at last have succeeded in understanding life. We are no longer primitive. We are no longer the creatures of, of fears. We have arrived at an adult uh, condition. And uh, here a man feels that he really is competent to order his own life and to plan his own existence. No longer is any God necessary. Man, after all, has now arrived and is able to do these things for himself. He rejoices, he bursts in his pride of life, and he says without any hesitation, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. He has looked into it all, and with his great capacity and with his great powers, he thus, I say, has got it all mapped. He rarely does know. Now, I think you'll agree that I'm not being unfair. God forbid that I should. I am making my statements on my knowledge of men and women 
on my reading of the newspapers and the journals and the books. And I suggest to you that I'm just giving uh, the description of modern man's view of life. He really is proud of himself and proud of his life and proud of the fact that he's a man who's living in the 20th century, who has thus mastered life. Well, the result of this is, you see, uh, something that shows itself in two main respects, which James puts uh, before us here. Holding this view of himself and his powers and of life, the modern man plans his life with confidence, with assurance, and with certainty. He says, uh, today or tomorrow, or today and tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and will buy and sell and get gain. Oh, we all know about this, don't we? We've all done it ourselves. We make our plans, we decide what we're going to do. We work out our program, we may even commit it to paper. There are no reservations, no hesitations at all. No possibilities of contingencies considered. Well, of course not. Life has become so organized and we know so much about it today. Uh, modern man acts as if he'd got an endless lease on life. He never even stops to consider that that may be wrong. He goes on from day to day without a single thought as to whether conceivably he's wrong in that view. He acts on the assumption that he's here forever. He's got an endless lease on life. And he therefore makes his plans, puts forward his proposals. Tomorrow I'm going to do this, the day after I'm going to do that. And I'm indeed going to do this for a whole year. And uh, I've decided exactly how my life is going to be spent. Isn't that it? How often do you hear people saying, God willing? How often do you hear people saying, if the Lord will? How often do they say, even today I hope to do so and so, I am going to do so and so. That's it. Life has become mastered by men, and he doesn't hesitate, I say, to look right into the future, and he tells us what he's going to do. And the other respect, of course, in which it works out is this, that the modern man is very confident that he knows what is best for himself, and that he knows what is real gain. It's all in that one verse, the 13th. Go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. This is the thing that really does appeal to the modern man. He's interested in gain. He believes and he prides himself, I say, particularly on this that he really knows what is best for himself. He thinks he knows what he wants, and what he wants, of course, is the best. Uh, he knows what will give him pleasure, and what will give him joy, and what will give him great gain. He's not the sort of man who's interested in pie in the sky, as he calls it. No, no. He wants to make the best of this world, and he knows what's good in this life and in this world. He's a practical, hard-headed man of affairs. There are no illusions about him. He's out for gain, frankly. He wants money, because with money you can get your food and your drink and your pleasure. You can run your car and you can have a wonderful house. You can do this and that. He's purely materialistic. Gain, that's the thing. Settle down in this life and in this world. Look after yourself. Do the best you can for yourself. Get this gain, which really makes life worth living. Gain is the thing. If you've got money, why, well, you can get anything. Given money, why, there's nothing that can stand before you. Life depends upon gain, possessions. I ask again, am I being unfair? Is this a caricature? Well, you see, the point I'm making all along is that James said all this in the first century, and this is the 20th century. Men were like that then, men are like that now, men have always been like that. And it all, you see, is a manifestation of this 
exulting and boasting in our pride of life. Thus men think that whatever his faults and deficiencies may be, at any rate he's always looking after himself. Look after number one, he says. I'm all right. I've got it all planned. I've worked it out. Today and tomorrow, for twelve months, I'm going to do well. I'm looking ahead. I'm not a fool. I'm laying down my plans. I've got it all under control. And I'm going to do this. And it's going to be marvelous. It's going to be wonderful. I'm going to get great gain. So men, boasting, rejoicing in his boastings, looks ahead and lays down his plans and congratulates himself in an anticipatory manner on the great gain that he's going to get out of it all and the wonderful life he's going to live. Very well. There is men, as he looks at himself, that is man's view of himself, that's man's view of men. But now let us look at the truth about men. And what does the Bible say about him? What is the truth about men? It's all stated here perfectly. Do you know the terrible thing about us all by nature is this, that we are just fools. Fools. Is that too strong a term? Well, let me substantiate it. Why do I say that man is a fool? Well, I say so for this reason. That here he is so proud of himself and proud of his knowledge. Whereas in reality he is ignorant of the primary and elementary things. The first thing. And at the same time, he is ignorant and tragically ignorant of the things that are most important. Now, that is the thing that I've got to work out with you. Modern man doesn't see that. He didn't see it in the days of James. This seems to me to be the whole essence of the modern folly, and I don't hesitate to to repeat that it is a tragedy. Man is boasting, I say, of his great knowledge, and in a sense, he has a right to do so, because his knowledge is truly remarkable. Yes, but he shouldn't be boasting about it as he does. Why? Well, because he's so ignorant about the primary things. It's very difficult to think of the appropriate illustration. Shall I give you the illustration, which you yourselves perhaps provide? There is no joke that is made so frequently at the expense of the medical profession than just this. Ha, says the layman, the medical profession, with all its boasting about its penicillin and its wonderful operations, how they can keep a man alive for such a long time when they're actually operating on his heart, uh, as it were, almost take the heart out of circulation and keep the men's circulation going. These miracle operations they're doing and all their miracle drugs and how they can cure all sorts of diseases. Very wonderful, says the modern layman, but you can't cure the modern common cold. And what's the value of all your boastings when you can't cure the common cold? Now that's it, isn't it? And there is something rather ridiculous about it, isn't there? That we can do these wonderful things and we can't do the ordinary things. Now, men, in general, is just like that at the present time. Here he is contemplating his astounding achievements, the results of scientific advance, all he can do in an experimental manner. And then, like a fool, he, on the basis of that, says, I'm marvelous, I'm perfect, I've got my life under control. But she hasn't. He is pathetically ignorant. And about the primary things, the fundamental things, above all, the most important and the most vital things of all, what are they? Well, listen to the list that is given by James. Here is a man who knows so much. What's he ignorant of? He's ignorant of tomorrow. He says what he's going to do in a year's time, but he knows nothing about tomorrow. Go to, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get grain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. He 
Here is modern man, I say, looking ahead and preparing and planning. In a sense, there's nothing wrong in that. It is but right that a man should look ahead and make preparations in a certain sense. Yes, but my dear friend, the way in which you and I do that is tremendously important. As James reminds us, we ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But we don't do that. You see, we leave that out and we say, now I'm going to do this. We lay down our friends dogmatically and definitely and without any reservations. And we calmly say, now tomorrow, I'm going to do this or that. And then tomorrow comes. And whoever imagined or thought for a moment that what happened on that morrow was going to happen. Think of people who sat down in their homes and said, now tomorrow and the day after, I, I'm going to do this or that. And tomorrow came. And you know what happened? It was their last day on earth. Tomorrow. We know nothing about tomorrow. Man with all his cleverness and all his ability to send up his rockets into that outer atmosphere, he knows nothing about tomorrow. Oh, I'm not saying anything about sending up your rockets. Let science boast of her achievements. Yes, but don't be a fool and say that because you can do that, you know everything and you know all about life because you don't. You don't know about tomorrow. Man is ignorant about tomorrow. Oh, yes, and not only tomorrow and the day after. But how ignorant is man about that endless tomorrow? For man goes on, you see, and life goes on, and the soul goes on, and there is an endless tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, and on and on it goes to all eternity. And what does modern man know about it? Here he is bursting, rejoicing in his boastings, exulting in his pride of life and saying, am I not wonderful? And isn't my life wonderful as I've planned it? And he knows nothing about tomorrow and all the tomorrows and tomorrows that will constitute eternity, that endless existence, that going on and on and on. He knows nothing about it. And yet, you see, he will not stop to consider this. He gets up and he says dogmatically, based upon his philosophy and his knowledge, today and tomorrow, I am going to, and for all twelve months. Isn't this sheer lunacy? Oh, the folly of it all. But he's not only ignorant of the morrow, he's ignorant of the nature of his own life. James puts this as a question, but it's really his way of making an assertion. He says, what is your life? You know all about science. Do you know what your life is? With all your consideration and your planning and your thinking ahead, tell me, says James, have you thought about your own life? What is your life? What is it? Now, my dear friends, let me just, I'm here simply tonight to put some simple and plain questions to you. I say they are questions that are being asked by a voice infinitely more powerful than mine. Haven't you been asking yourself the last few days, what is my life? If you haven't, I say you're a fool. If you can have lived since last Tuesday without asking yourself, what is my life? then you're completely unintelligent. Though you may know all about science and you're boasting about these marvelous researches of men. The eyes of the fool, says the Old Testament, are on the ends of the earth. I'm inviting you to come back onto your own doorstep this evening. Forget all about science for a moment. Before you begin to think about things like that, what about your life? What is your life? What does man know about life? And the answer is your life is nothing but a vapor that appeareth for a little season 
and then vanishes away. There's something almost incredible about this, isn't there? You'd have thought that every one of us, in view of what we read in our papers from time to time and what we hear, you'd have thought that we'd all be perfectly clear about this, that that is the true description of our life in this world. It's but a vapor. What is he referring to? Well, he is just emphasizing the passing and the ephemeral nature of life. It's absolute frailty, like a puff of air, like a breath. Oh, our lives in this world are so frail. They're at the mercy of so many things that can happen to them. You see, the very processes of life itself, they're so delicately balanced. It's almost an amazing thing that we can go on living at all, and we are aging, and the processes are developing. We're at the mercy of these things. At any moment, something can go wrong with us functionally. Have you stopped to consider that? What a delicate balance there is in the life of every one of us. Personally speaking, the main effect that the study of anatomy and physiology had upon me was to make me be filled with amazement that we live at all. You'd have thought that if a man bends suddenly, it would be enough to put something out of gear. But we are so delicately balanced, it's a fine adjustment. Yes, but at any moment, something can go wrong. And then think of disease. You never know when it's coming. Oh, but sir, someone, this is being morbid. It's not being morbid, it's being realistic. And if you don't like facing facts, there's only one thing to say about you, that is, again, you're a fool. And it's no use claiming that you're a modern man, and that you think, and that you use your brain, and that you're scientific, if you don't look at facts because they're unpleasant. The business of the scientist is to look at all the facts that are there, whether he likes them or not. And here is one of the great facts, the frailty of life, disease, these little germs, ultra-microscopic, this church is probably full of them at this moment. These viruses can suddenly enter and grip you. Poliomyelitis. Only the other evening a lady came in to me to tell me that her husband, a young man, the father of two little children, had suddenly had that fell polio and that he was dead and buried. They came here regularly. Thank God he was ready to go. But such, you see, is the frailty of life. Taken suddenly ill. Diagnosis, influenza. The next day, obviously it wasn't. Rushed into hospital. Lung, chest paralyzed. Artificial lung, everything that science can do. But no good. The frailty of life, my dear friend, what is your life? It's but a vapor. Oh, let me add the other thing. Accident. Accident. You go out of your house in the morning saying, Today and tomorrow I'm going to do this. Accident. There is no tomorrow for you. It's the end. Oh, I'm just trying to say this, that this life of ours is frail. It's tenuous. It's like a little silken cord. And at any moment it may snap and break. The certainty of death is the greatest certainty of all. And yet modern men won't face it. That's why I say he's a fool. He says today and tomorrow. He doesn't consider death the absolute certainty of death. And coupled with the absolute certainty of death, the uncertainty as to when it's going to happen. Put those two together. It's the most amazing thing of all that any man can miss it. Death is certain, the moment of death is uncertain, and yet we say today and tomorrow, the next twelve months. Go to, says James. Don't be fools. Stop and consider what is your life. Modern man with all his boasting is ignorant of his life and its real nature. 
And the next thing that he's ignorant, of course, of is this. He is of the Lord and his absolute sovereignty. For that he ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But he doesn't think of the Lord. He doesn't know about the Lord. He's a, a scientist. He's a materialist. He listens to the brain's trust. There isn't a God. Therefore I can say this and that. And the Lord is forgotten. But the Lord is there. And our times are in the hands of the Lord. And we are all of us in his hands. It is he who made the world and set the time process going. He disposes of everything and he controls everything. He is at the back of the sun and the moon and the stars and the rain and the sunshine. He is the God of providence. He is the God that is over all and rules over all. But the modern man is ignorant of this. He doesn't know what I read in the sixth verse. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. He doesn't know about that. He doesn't realize that. He doesn't know what we are told in verse 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou? that judges to another? In other words, what the modern man is ignorant of is this, that God is, that he is over all, that he is judge of all the earth, that he can end our life at any moment in spite of science and everything else, that it's all absolutely, utterly in his hands, and that when we die, we go on to judgment, and to meet and to face God, and that he is a just and a righteous and a holy God. God resisteth the proud. And here is modern men rejoicing in his boastings, proud of his pride of life. And he doesn't know that this God under whose hand he is, Resist such a person and is against such a being and his wrath is against such a being. The modern man is ignorant of that. And thus he makes his boastful statements and thus he proposes and plans and suddenly disaster comes and he's bewildered and doesn't know where he is. He is ignorant of the Lord. And finally... He is ignorant of true gain. He thinks he knows all about gain. Today and tomorrow we shall go into such a city and trade there and continue a year and buy and sell and get gain. Marvelous, he says. But what's his conception of gain? As I told you, it's purely materialistic. Possessions, money, goods, things, houses, cars, Pleasure, enjoyment, these are his ideas of gain. Yes, but he doesn't realize that moth and rust can corrupt all these and eat into them and destroy them, and that finally when he comes to die, he leaves them all behind and is left empty-handed. Though he may have been a millionaire, the accident happens, he's got nothing. He goes empty-handed as a naked soul face to face with his God and his judge eternal. That's what the modern man doesn't know. As men did not know it in the time of James. Oh, but this is a tragedy. If men but knew what is real gain. What is real gain? Well, I'll tell you. It is the life of the soul. Not the life of the body, but the life of the soul. Gain? Dear, are you interested in gain? The modern man is. He wants to get on. He wants to know the best people. Wants to get into the best clubs. Wants to be presented to the queen. He wants to get on and to know people. He thinks that's gain. Oh, if you're interested in gain, I'll tell you what gain is. To know God. To be a friend of God. To have fellowship with God. 
But how can a man have fellowship with God? Well, this is the answer. Though we are all fools by nature and have all sinned against God and deserve nothing but his wrath, and though he resists us in our pride, you remember what we are told, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Draw nigh unto God. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's the marvelous thing. In other words, this is gain, that a man comes to see his folly, the precarious condition of his life, that his life is but a vapor. He awakens to it all. He sees he's been a fool, that he's under the wrath of God. He says, what can I do? What shall it profit a man, though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And suddenly he meets this word, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, which means go to God and acknowledge and confess your sin. Tell him that you've been arrogant and proud and boastful, that you've said today and tomorrow, and you haven't thought of God, and you've sinned against him. Confess it. Get down before him. Humble yourself. Abase yourself. Put on sackcloth and ashes, metaphorically speaking. Ask him to have mercy upon you. And wonder of wonders, this is what will happen. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. Go to him and acknowledge and confess your sins. And he will tell you whatever you've been, whatever you've done, that he has so loved you with an everlasting love that he sent his only son into the world to rescue you and redeem you. That he put your sins on his son and smote him and punished your sins in him and offers you a free pardon and a free forgiveness. Gain! That's gain. Forgiveness for nothing. Reconciliation unto God without money and without price. And thus I say, being reconciled, you begin to enjoy life with God. Life of the soul. Life of the spirit. You begin to receive God's blessings you begin to see that there's nothing in the world that is comparable to holiness and sanctity and truth. You would prefer to be a pauper and yet a holy man in communion with God than the richest man in the whole world without God. Purity and cleanliness, the joy of the Lord and his salvation, manifestations of heaven while you're still on earth, foretastes of glory while still in this world of time. The death, death and the fear of death have gone and are banished. You say, it doesn't matter what happens to me, I can never be separated from the love of God. That's gain, that is true riches. And then the certain knowledge that after death, when you've left this world and all its things behind you, you go to be with God and with Christ. You enter into an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away. There are no accidents there. There are no sorrow and crying and dying there. The mightiest bombs of men can't touch that. Let hell be let loose. You're safe there. Incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven by God for them that love him. You know you're going to it. So that you're no longer troubled and frightened at the fact that your life is a vapor. You know that death means to be with Christ, which is far better than to enter into the glories and the joys and the possession of everlasting and eternal bliss. Oh, my beloved friend, have you been working out this argument during these past days? Has this thing that has happened made you say, what is my life? Am I right in my view? Am I banking on the right things? Have I got true riches? Have I got real gain? And have you come to see that you haven't? 
but that because God is love and full of mercy and compassion and pity, that though we have sinned against him and forfeited every claim upon his love, he is ready to receive us, to pardon us in Christ, to make us his children, to give us this new nature, to shower his blessings upon us, and in the end, receive us unto himself. Have you worked out the argument, I ask? Have you considered these things? Oh, stop boasting and rejoicing in your boastings. It'll all come to nothing. There is only one thing that matters for every one of us. And that is to know God. The Lord who controls everything. I've told you how he can be known. Thank God. It's open to you now. If you've never known him, draw nigh unto God. Come unto him as you are confessing your sin and failure. Cast yourself upon the love and mercy of God in Christ. Draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. I'm glad I can tell you that. You may not be here a week tonight. I may not be here. What is your life? What do you know about tomorrow? Well, when do you settle all this? Settle it now. Settle it now. You needn't wait a second to become a Christian. It isn't what you and I do. It's what Christ has done for us. This is something to be believed and to be received. It can be done here and now. Clinch it now. You may not get home tonight. Do it now. Recognizing the character of life in this world. That it's but as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Settle your eternal destiny now. Draw nigh unto God. And God will draw nigh unto you. What shall it profit a man though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Draw nigh unto him, and you will gain heaven, a knowledge of God that will be with you and sustain you throughout the remainder of this changing, uncertain life that will carry you through death and that you will enjoy through all eternity. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.